Commissioner Schuster, do you have anything further with the Wildlife Committee? Uh, I just wanted to thank Gray for his presentation, and uh, that's it for the Wildlife Committee. Chairman Brown, thank you. All right. We move on to fisheries and Commissioner McMillan. This time we're going to ask uh, Frank Fist to give us an update on fish regulation. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, I was asked to just give an update on the uh, on where we're at in the fishing regulation process. So this will be a pretty brief uh, sneak preview to the real regulation process. Uh, we'll be talking about rules or the regulations, and by that I mean just in general proclamation and rule that we we cobble together to basically protect the resource and to make fishing better. That's our that's our basic objective in all this. Uh, most of the rules that we work on or and proclamations a lot of times are just to make fishing better they're not trying to save populations at risk but sometimes they are uh, the, the factors that we consider when we're setting regulations we have to consider the biological limits of the populations uh, the needs of the user groups and we do try to keep it simple believe it or not uh, these factors are often conflicting a lot of times people want things that the the biology just won't let us do. A lot of times the user groups are at odds with each other about what they want out of a resource. And when we try to piece something together that might fit all those issues, you end up with complicated regulations. So really all these factors are at odds and that's what we, that's why we have a, a rather long process to include the public and include a lot of review within the agency to develop our regulations. And here's the timeline. In April each year, we request uh, public comment from, from anglers. Uh, it, this is not the only way we receive uh, public, uh, uh, what I call it, public interest or public opinion about our fisheries. We get people calling all the time throughout the year. We welcome those calls. But this is our most formal request. Usually we give people about 30 days. It's advertised through the press releases, and we get comments back usually anywhere between 50 and 150 emails typically at that same time our regional staff are meeting with their law enforcement and other staff in their region about proposals to see what would be appropriate for the coming year and then in May all of our fishery staff meet for a one-day meeting uh, usually over two-day meeting uh, to discuss all the proposals and we may we may discuss proposals that we're going to talk about for this coming year or we may just share information about things we need to be watching for it down the road then in June and July we have a, a rough draft of the proposals from that May meeting those go back and they're discussed at the regional uh, level during their 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 staff meetings and there's a lot of opportunity for for changes and, and discussion of, of the of the regulations at that time and what I rather than just go through this whole timeline and be really boring I wanted to at least give you a tidbit or a, a couple some information about what we're gonna be talking what we did talk about in May and what we're still mulling over during this June and July period uh, we've got several topics that span a lot of issues I'm pretty excited about this year in particular in that most of the changes that we're making, almost all of them, either make it, make it easier, uh, standardize the regulation somehow, uh, or, um, or allow people to harvest more fish. There, a lot of them are actually lowering uh, limits, or lowering length limits, if you will, and increasing uh, allowable harvest. So we should get a lot of support from people that want to see us allow more, more harvest. Uh, for that, that previous slide was the Alabama rig. Obviously, we need to simplify that, and we're working towards that. The, this table here is our wild trout regulations that's currently in the fishing guide. You can see it's pretty cumbersome, and after 20 years of trout research, we've determined that there are a lot of these rules are, are unnecessary, and we've, we've streamlined it down to just nine streams. We're going to promote uh, the best of the best wild trout fishing, and we've gone to meetings with numerous trout unlimited organizations and they're all behind the biology and our recommendations another issue is uh, skipjack herring over 
the last several of our May meetings, we've had our biologists ask, hey, what about your skipjack populations? Skipjack are a, uh, a native species to Tennessee. They're common in the big rivers. Seasonally, you can catch them every cast in some places. They seemingly are very abundant when you can catch them. But we've had a number of our, uh, of our prominent guides around the state calling saying, hey, you know, some years we're not seeing them like we used to. So we're a little concerned about skipjack and we're wondering if we should continue to allow unlimited harvest of these animals for bait. And there's also an issue in the last few years where uh, we've had people coming from other states loading up just 55 gallon drum loads of these fish and hauling them back up, brining them and selling them in other states. So we, we feel like there's, there may be a need to limit some of that, although we can still provide some fishery for this. We got the most comments of any for, for muskie this year. Uh, our, our muskie anglers are very uh, supportive of our fisheries. They just want us to be more restrictive and make sure we take the utmost care of what we have. And we, at our May meeting, we discussed the muskie fisheries and we still feel like there's some missing information that we need to have before we can move forward. Uh, we, as you might know, the, the steam plant at, uh, at Bull Run did not operate this year, which, which is what created the, uh, the easy fishing in the warm water below Bull Run. So we really didn't get an opportunity to evaluate some things we needed to as we move forward on that. Just a few more topics that we discussed. Uh, there's, this will be the first year that Carroll County Lake will be open for fishing. That's a new one in Region 1. So there were some regulations provided for that. Uh, this on Kentucky Lake, there's interest in standardizing this, the readier sunfish creel to bring it in line with the rest of the state. Again, standardizing. Cordell Hull, we're looking at lowering the slot limit that's there. It's currently rather high. We're considering bringing that down, allowing a little more harvest, and, and actually getting the numbers more in line with what's happening on Dale Hollow. So it, it's, again, somewhat standardized. At Pickwick Lake, we're, you know, we have a, a lot of our lakes have an 18-inch size limit on smallmouth bass, and we are, we are proposing right now, we're still discussing all these, of course, but bringing these down to, uh, for smallmouth to 15 inches on Pickwick Lake, because we share management of that lake with Mississippi and Alabama, and we've been at, uh, we've been not able to come to an agreement on what should be done down there. This is a, a step towards that. We feel that if, if they would come down, if we came down to 15 on smallmouth, Alabama would come up to 15 on the largemouth. We could just have one rule for all bass on that reservoir. That, that, that's our goal, we're, so we don't have different rules in different, in different states on that common. So this is, our, this is our step forward, and we'll be talking more with those states later this year. At Parksville Lake, we have a, 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 a subspecies of spotted bass that's been introduced down there. This is down in the southeast corner of the state. And these, uh, they're called Alabama bass. They've been introduced by we, someone, we don't know who, not us. And they've pretty much taken over Parksville Lake. And we don't know uh, what problems this could cause in other lakes in the state. So we want to do, we want to set some, uh, some pretty liberal creel limits down there to encourage the take of these things. I don't think we can ever get rid of them completely by doing this, but we want to send a message that they're not something that you want to have in all the lakes in Tennessee. So we're looking at some pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good creel limits that will allow them to take a lot of those fish out. On, uh, con on Cherokee Lake, we, we recognize that we don't have reproduction uh, on, on this lake for walleye and sauger, and actually the managers are looking at stocking the sawgye there. So since this is gonna be a, a hatchery supported system, we don't need to have a really high creel limit to protect spawning stock. So we're gonna actually lower the creel limit here from the regular state level and allow more harvest on, on this lake. We also talked about commercial fishing topics. Uh, we, we will have to address bow fishing as a commercial gear in our proclamation to fall in line with some, with the licenses that were previously discussed at earlier meetings. Uh, we discussed quotas for commercial licenses and we discussed 
catfish length limits. And incidentally, we are also meeting with the Commercial Fish Advisory Committee June 20th next week. Uh, so we'll, they'll probably have more uh, suggestions for our consideration as well. And again, at, at this point, you know, where we are at in this uh, regulation timeline, we will be bringing all these suggestions together into one formal uh, package to bring in the August director staff meeting, you know, the early in the month in August, and then later in August that what comes out of that meeting will be presented to the commission as the official preview. At that point, you know, that's a public meeting, of course, and the, the public can, can see that tape now. Uh, they'll have, we'll invite public comment on what we suggest, so they have another 45 days to comment on this. And we, we can get that information back to the commission so they're aware of what the public thought about our proposals. And then in October, the commission can finally vote on those proclamations and rules. Then during the winter, we uh, revamp the fishing guide, making the edits that are necessary and get the contract with the printer and get it all printed by the third week of February. And of course, all the rules that we have are uh, effective March 1, so that starts the cycle all over again. So that's basically where we are in the fishing proclamation timeline. Any questions? Any questions from the commission? Quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, Commissioner Mellon brought up the potential for licensing fishing guides. Do you foresee that coming up in this this coming discussion, or will it be down the road? Or is that a question for me or Commissioner McMillan? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, last last I heard of that is that we're still figuring out the best way to to approach that problem. Uh, I heard that we should be setting up perhaps meeting with the users of the rivers locally to Upper East Tennessee, and if we have similar issues on the Caney Fork area this year, have another type of meeting. I don't think the actual guide license is necessarily uh, a de facto goal of the meeting. It's just uh, I think we need to get at the root of the problem in those areas and see what, what we need to do to go forward. But that's, that's a, a big boating issue in there, and there's a fishing issue, so we got to bring everyone together. Summer is slipping away, though. It's, Good, time, good that you bring that up. And I'm hearing it's begin to come up in the striped bass uh, community as well. Some concerns about um, out-of-state folks guiding and oh, okay. water and kind of abusing it. And, and that's questions be coming. I just want to be able to pass on where we think that's going or where it stands right now. So we're, thank you. Okay. I, I guess we're waiting to see who's going to be reappointed uh, to the commission, but uh, tentatively have a a meeting in July hopefully that just to talk about what you just said about how the way we left it last year was that when I was pushing hard uh, for the guy out of state guide license that we were picking on a certain in, entity when there was more of a problem than just that yeah, and so I agreed to wait and let us see if we couldn't get all the groups that were using the rivers together to determine and see if we could get you know, there's so many more people using a river, but in our law enforcement, and if we're going to be involved, you know, do we want to have stickers on canoes and kayaks, all that kind of thing? So we're still, we're just kind of waiting and see, put on hold, and then we're going to go from there. So, okay. any more questions? How about from the audience? Any any comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Uh, the Boating Law Enforcement Committee recognizes Glenn Motes, Assistant Chief Boating and Law Enforcement. Thank you, Commissioner. I would just like to briefly highlight the boating safety work efforts uh, of our wildlife officers and boating officers over the recent Memorial Day weekend. Excuse me. And I do say briefly, um, I'm thankful that law enforcement is not quite as mysterious as quail management. 
Um, but anyway, as you remember, the temperatures were in the 90s. Over the last weekend, uh, we had relatively low gas prices, so that made for a great weekend to get out and go boating. Uh, and our officers did an excellent job uh, over the weekend providing a safe and enjoyable environment. If you, if you look at the stats I've got up here, you can see that we responded to only eight boat accidents. We had no fatalities, which was good. You can see that we assisted 200 boaters in, uh, with on-the-water issues, checked over 8,000 vessels for compliance with the regulation. You can see that we made 22 BUI arrests, which meant um, impaired operators were taken off the water before they caused an accident. Although 470 citations were issued for violations, you can see that another 462 operators um, were issued warnings, written warnings. We also provided support at four major marine events across the state, primarily music concerts on the water. So that's, uh, that's just a real brief summary of what law enforcement activities we had uh, over the weekend. You may ask how that compares to last year, Memorial Day weekend, and I'm glad you asked, <laughs> because I do just have that. You can see we, uh, we inspected a few more vessels this, this year than we did last year. Uh, actual citations were down while warnings were up. Uh, BUI arrests were roughly the same as far as accidents. So. You can see we did assist quite a few more boaters this year. So, just wanted to uh, come in and congratulate our law enforcement guys for the work that they do. Thank you, Glenn. That's okay. a difficult weekend, and we appreciate you know keeping people safe out there on the water during that time. So, okay. thank, thank you so much. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? All right, that's good. Thank you, Glenn. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Thank you. Um, the Retention and Recruitment Committee uh, recognizes Frank Fiss, Assistant Chief, Fisheries Division. Well, as everyone should know, uh, last Saturday was free fishing day, and that's the time of year when uh, most of the kids fishing rodeos happen in the state. It's a, it's a big day for fishing all over. Uh, I'm giving this presentation because I was asked, but uh, by no means probably the authority or the best person to give it because there are so many people in the agency that work on these things from our law enforcement officers to our fish biologists to our INE staff. Just it's an all hands effort. And uh, they were great uh, about sending me pictures from the last weekend. We don't have stats. I think a lot of the organizers of these events are still recovering from keeping up with 300 kids running around. But uh, these are typical stats that we have in a given year. We've got 80 rodeos uh, actually register with our TWA website. That th there's several others that probably happen throughout the state that are just not affiliated with us. But it's, it's a good thing, so more people are doing it. Uh, those rodeos uh, you can encounter up to you know 15,000 kids in, in all those collectively. Uh, some of the bigger ones on their best years will have up to 700 kids showing up, and of course they're showing up with families, so you can imagine the crowds. Um, that most of them, like I say, uh, occur on free fishing day, but there are others that events that happen from April through you know throughout the year, basically the fishing year. I uh, put this uh, flyer up for the Nashville Rodeo because it has just reminds me to talk about sponsors and partnerships. All of these rodeos have some local community that, that is just a true partner on it, and then there's a bunch of sponsors that make it happen. And it's, it's a really great, they're really great events in that regard because they get our people, give us another way to in, engage the community that they're in. Just uh, just go over the tasks involved. I mean, 
Got to start advertising the events. There's websites to keep up with. There's site prep. Probably have to get permits or coordinate. You know, what we're going to use where we're going to park all the vehicles. There's stocking that goes on. We we stock 58 locations with channel catfish. Uh, 45,000 pounds of fish are purchased from vendors. Mike Bramlett, my office, uh, he takes care of all that that purchasing and sorting that out. Uh, again, sponsors, you know, a lot of them want to do these uh, rodeo events. Some of them are asked, so that's another job, collecting sponsors and organizing all that. We, we usually will have some loaner rods at a lot of these, so we've got to maintain a, a working set of rods. There's bait provided, uh, brochures, registration. We, we set up a weigh-in at most of these. That involves getting somebody there to can work a scale and you know, determining who wins the awards. A lot of the awards are, are just set up by age group or, you know, biggest fish, little fish, or most weight or something. And then there's a bunch of cleanup. I mean, so there, there's a lot of our agency staff that get involved in this. It's a big weekend. And it's not just staff. A lot of times the spouses or older uh, kids they might have will get involved. It's, it's a, definitely an all, all hands event. But the benefits are there. It's family fun. You got, kid, you got kids fishing. You got a lot of kids get might catch their first fish. And again, it's... TWA gets a chance to work with the community. A lot of these communities con consider this just a tradition that they expect it to happen every year, and they're, they're really excited about it when it comes around. What I, like I said, I wasn't able to get real uh, uh, an accurate report of what happened last Saturday, but they did send me a bunch of pictures, and I think they're worth a thousand words in this case, just to give you a sense of scale for what's going on at these. Here's uh, Stone Ridge Park down in Fayetteville. I thought this was the Washington Monument I'm looking for. Someone to run out yelling forest any minute now. Uh, there's there's a few hundred kids fishing this event. This is just a the cement pond, uh, but it gets used. These kids had a great time. Those are some of the catfish that were stocked. Here's the Chuck Copeland Memorial. This one's named after uh, our our late fisheries manager down there. This is a, on Watts Bar Lake. They do a great job with this. It's a big big event. Uh, down in Spring City, you see all the bicycles, I and mean, somebody's got to round all that up, all the gear in the background. This, these tanks don't just show up, they're pretty heavy. Uh, these kids had a great time, awards were given, bikes were won. This kid had a whale or something, he had a good time. Here's a typical weigh in situation. Uh, uh, ten, usually, at one of our fisheries guys gets confronted with just stringer after stringer of fish stuck together, and we pull them all apart and tell ooh and ah over every catch and tell them what they've, what they've got. Here's a winner. Here's uh, some pictures from the Catfish Rodeo in Nashville. We had a, apparently a, a professional photographer donated his time. That's why there's a watermark on these, but he's wel we're welcome to use these photos if we get them. Um, we got some good pictures. There's our, some of our fish, some happy fishermen, good action shots. Some, some guide reading the water there. <laughs> and uh, threw this one in because there's a, it's, it's a non-agency vendor here. Uh, a lot of times some of the cooperators will have some other message about, you know, uh, good things to do, water safety, environmental uh, education stuff they'll set up booths associated with. So uh, and one of the, the derby that I was at over in uh, Carroll Lake was actually one where they were having a little bit of awareness about uh, cancer. It was the fundraiser for cancer at the same time. So there's all kinds of different partnerships and educational opportunities is a component of a lot of these. Eric Ryan James smiling. And, and here's one from the Germantown Rodeo, the Mid-South Fishing Rodeo. A lot of people out there. Again, you get to see everyone's fish. Some celebrities will come by. There's Bill Dance. I guess he, he must have emceed the awards. This girl, I'm told, won a lifetime fishing license. So that's a pretty neat, neat prize. And here's uh, Region 2. It's, a, it's on Woods Reservoir. It's called Mars Ferry. This massive bridge structure thing here, I've not seen it myself. I've been hearing about it because the Region 2 fisheries crew has been working on on the pier and we've been kind of joking like well, how much time could they spend on a pier but look at this pier it's huge they had to put all these things uh, the the foundation had to be it had to be built from the ground up 
I know that they spent a lot of time working on this, but it got a lot of use on, on Saturday. It was hundreds of kids fishing there. Again, one of our catfish. What the, look, you can see in the background, I believe they've they set up a block net so the fish don't all swim out into the lake. It's kind of fish in a barrel situation. There's just another shot. I'm sure somebody got hung by somebody. Let's see. Uh, and just threw this picture in. This was forwarded by, by Daryl, who couldn't make it today, but he, he had a fishing derby with his church group. And so just to remind us that not all of them are these mega carnival things. There's a lot of smaller scale uh, derbies that occur on free fishing day. And uh, I don't know, if this group may have had it whether Daryl was there or not. Not to take anything from Daryl, but you know, I know the guy that was working with him, he's a big fisherman. So there's, un, you know, by us setting an example of doing this, there's probably untold groups that are going out and, and getting these started. And uh, I'll close with that. I, I think there is, there's a future in fishing if these kids can stay interested. So. Thanks, Frank. I think it's a great, uh, it's great PR for the agency too, to the community. I used to work quite a few of these and it's the easiest way to get kids involved in the outdoors. Yeah. And uh, their excitement of catching a first fish is unbelievable. Even if it's just two inches tall, they just get pretty excited. So mm -hmm. thanks to you and the agency and all you do to, to make that happen. Anyone else? All right, thanks Frank, Good, thanks. appreciate it. Chairman Brown. We have a request to uh, expand this coming year's budget and this being a historic moment for the commission it's also a historic moment for me this is the shortest presentation I've ever made in front of the commission uh, one slide but we have uh, what we collectively call non-game projects and these have federal funding bases and we have to accommodate that federal funding in our budget. One of them is section six, which is section six of the Endangered Species Act that provides funding for states to do good work for endangered species. And uh, this is part of the federal component. We already have the other part built into the current, uh, the coming year's budget, but this is the part that we need to uh, request expansion, budget expansion for. And this money, I thought, instead of me just standing up here and giving you a total number for what we need to do, I'd give you a little background of what we do with the money. So, <clears throat> this since we have no source of state revenue that we can turn to to fund these projects, since they are non-game, and particularly Section 6, is aimed directly at listed threat, threatened and endangered species, uh, we spend this portion of the money on contracted uh, survey work or research or restoration projects that we basically pass the money through and give to somebody else and they have to make the match. The second one there, state wildlife grants, is the other source of federal funding we get for non-game species, and we're budgeting for the SWIG 11 year. This is only the 11th year of this total program. Congress, back in about 2000, established this program and actually funded it pretty well up until this last year with all the budget cuts, and we took a 40% cut in this program. So. It whacked us down to a, a level that basically we can only fund what we do as an agency. And uh, we have that in the budget, but we're off just a little bit because we didn't include the burn teams uh, from Region 2, 3, and 4, and we didn't include this program called TAMP, which is a Tennessee Amphibian Monitoring Program. The and, and just to give you a sense of how this program is different from Section 6, the burn teams 
these are the folks in the agency that go out and create the prairies, the savannas, burn the, the built up uh, fuel portion of the, the leaf litter in the, in the forest and create this habitat that Gray was talking about, about this early successional habitat. So there's a tie-in with both game species and non-game species, such as ground nesting birds that aren't necessarily quail, uh, that benefits both at the same time. So we can build programs around a lot of species, some of which are game species. And then the last one is a, uh, also something that's a good tie-in to other things that we do uh, on uh, Yanali Management Area down on the Duck River east of Columbia. We have the Nature Conservancy that is building a permanent easement with a farmer down there who has a large tract of land that was going to put 300-foot buffers along the Duck River that will tie in components of Yanali management area that are distinct. They're separate from the, the other areas, kind of like uh, the picture of the areas that Tim showed, except these will create corridors between the isolated management areas. So uh, this is a really good project. They've got, they, uh, from the Maddox Foundation here in Nashville, they've got over $75,000. They're chunking in a big chunk of change themselves to pull this off, and we're going to throw in $40,000 to help make it work. Uh, this is a permanent easement. This land will always be in this condition. Uh, it will never change. So it's just like it was almost in our management area. So we're requesting that we expand the budget for those amounts. <coughs> Approved. So moved. Second. To move and second that we approve the just presented budget expansion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. If, if I could make one last statement. There's six of us, I counted heads in here, there's six of us that were here as part of the group that met with the commission 16 years ago when I started. And I think to the person, they would all agree that uh, you guys are the best we've ever had. You're just, you've been everything that we've always needed in a commission. You've supported us. You've been there for us. If we drifted off a little bit, you straightened us out. So for me, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gordon? Thank you, Commissioner Parks, Commissioners. Uh, I'll have to uh, say that I agree with Mr. Reed's assessment of the Commission. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a quick update on the real estate transactions. Uh, since your booklet was uh, sent out to you. Uh, down in Giles County, we have a uh, park and launch area. Uh, this, uh, we just received the phase one environmental assessment, which cleared this track for acquisition. Uh, down in Hamlin County, this is the Morristown Fish Hatchery. We've also got the phase one environmental in on it, and the appraisal is in the hands of the review appraiser. Switching on uh, down to Meigs County, the Hawassi Refuge, 68 acres uh, acquisition. Uh, we have a phase one environmental that was completed on it um, about two days ago. And then we have one new transaction uh, to announce in Morgan County, we have a gentleman by the name of David Reister that is wanting to give us 47.5 acres of fishing frontage on, on the Emory River. And uh, we talked to Mr. Reiser and uh, he's uh, really excited about uh, us having the opportunity to Im improve the fishing on the Emory River. 
And that's about all I have. Any questions? Thank you, Gordon. Okay, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, that's it. Uh, anyone on the commission have any questions or comments? Anything further to discuss at this time? Anyone from the audience have any matters to discuss? Okay. All right. We'll be adjourned till 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs>